Thank you very much. I'd like to do a quick poll to see who we have in the room. So uh, those people who are maybe already playing a tech lead or a lead developer role, maybe you could just stand up. Let's just see who we have in the room. Ah, OK, excellent. Thank you. Uh, what about people who would like to be a tech lead or a lead developer, people who are thinking about this in the future? OK. And do we have any sort of managers or other sort of management roles? All right, great. Thank you. So um, this talk is very much aimed at tech leads or people considering this. People who are in leadership roles will also benefit from this. Uh, but it is really focused on this role of a tech lead. And it's very interesting because our industry is still very young. I mean, Agile is still very young as well. It's really nice to see this community here. And one of the things that I've learned to working in Agile teams for a very long time is technical leadership still matters. And that's one of the interesting reasons why this role is still important. And we'll talk a little bit about where it comes from, what it means to be successful, uh, and maybe how you go about becoming a better technical lead. A little bit about myself first, though. So um, I'm the chief scientist and former CTO of N26. Some of you might know N26. We're a Berlin-based digital challenger bank. Uh, some of you might even be customers. Uh, and um, we're on a mission to really bring banking uh, that the world loves. So it's an interesting kind of proposition because you don't often hear bank and the word love in the same sentence. Um, I've been working in technology for almost 20 years. I've published a number of books, so a lot of this has been working in agile environments. I worked with ThoughtWorks for about 14 years, helping companies adopt agile, continuous delivery, and really good ways of working, uh, and sort of reflected in the book about building evolutionary architectures, but that's not really the focus. The focus for today is really about this book about talking with tech leads. Uh, and during this book, I interviewed a whole bunch of people who've either been on this journey, like some of the people in this room, and maybe people who've just found themselves in this role for the first time. And if those people who are currently playing this role realize what that first time was like, you know perhaps how traumatizing it was, or maybe there was a lack of support. And that kind of that shares a number of stories about people's experiences going through this journey together. One of my other passions is really helping people get better at this, and I actually do a training course. I run this internally to N26. Uh, I've started to do it more ad hoc externally. Um, and for those of you who might be interested, I also run a newsletter called Level Up, and it's aimed at leaders in technology. So everyone from engineering managers, tech leads, all the way up to CTO. But today, we're going to go on a little bit of a journey, and we're going to go through five different stages. So one is really about this archetypical story about how people find themselves in this role of a tech lead. Then it's useful for us to define what is exactly this tech lead. I've experienced that it's very different across many different companies, uh, and we'll look at what I mean by a tech lead. And then we'll look at some surprises and struggles. So those of you who've played this role, maybe those of you who might play this role, you probably will maybe get surprised and, and understand some of the common struggles of what this role means. And then we'll look at a couple of tools and techniques, so something practical that I want to give you that will helpfully make you a much stronger tech lead or leader in many other cases. Along the way, we'll look at five lessons learned that will also help you understand how you can become a much better tech lead. So let's start with the archetypical story about how people get into this. Now, a lot of people who come into software, they start off as an engineer or a developer of some sort, right? And as an engineer, you're often solving problems, you're wanting more interesting problems, more of a challenge to solve, and you sort of start looking for something that's a little bit different, right? We all want to grow and we all want to learn. And there are two kind of ways that people find themselves in this role. The first one is internally, right? Somebody goes, I want to be promoted. I want a greater challenge. I want to have something that's much more challenging and help me get there. In a lot, a lot of other circumstances, people in your organization might look at you and say, hey, you know, I think you're ready to be promoted. I think you're ready for a greater challenge. We want to give you a stretch opportunity and give you an opportunity to try to lead the team. Now, what's interesting is you end up um, thinking, well, this is definitely a step up in a career ladder. And one of the things that I really want to enforce and underscore here is that it's definitely not this idea. And we'll come back to the idea of a career ladder and, and why it isn't. But let's say that you've now graduated to having this idea of being a tech lead, uh, and you go back to your computer as you were as an engineer with this new label, right? This badge that says, I am a tech lead. And normally, what's happening here is you're starting to think, well, what do I do differently? Right? As an engineer, I was taking on complex problems. Uh, I go and solve them. Do I do more of that? 
What exactly is expected of me? And this is definitely a challenge that a lot of people have when they first step into this role. It's not really clear what is expected of them. This is true of a lot of other roles, but particularly for the tech lead role. So lesson one is really the tech lead is not a promotion. It's a role change. And this is very interesting, right? Because as an engineer, you're thinking, oh, I get to do more of the things that I was doing before. I get to have more decision-making power over everyone. Actually, you don't. It's very different. And you have different expectations about what that role entails. So we'll go back to the career ladder. And this is quite important because uh, a lot of companies here are probably growing. I know that the beat is growing quite quickly. And one of the interesting things you do in a sort of scale up is you start to define some things like growth paths and, and sort of define career ladders. For existing companies, perhaps they're already defined as such. And one of the interesting things that I've learned about defining uh, career ladders is a few tips if you're actually going to use this very well. So normally a career ladder kind of looks like this, right? Is you have a number of positions, and the higher the position, the idea is that that position at a higher level will have a broader impact. And a good engineer or a career ladder will describe what are the behaviors or expectations associated with that role to have that level of impact. And that can map true to different types of disciplines, and then you map it into sort of technical roles. Now, some tips if you're going to use this is that it's not a complete checklist. So a lot of people think, OK, I do these things, therefore I'm ready for that, uh, um, that sort of next step. It's very useful, but it's incomplete. And one of the reasons it's incomplete is everyone here is a little bit different, and we'll come back to this. It's, it's really useful as a guide for a conversation, right? So it helps set expectations about generally what is the level of impact, how it should appear, what are some expected behaviors, but it's not a complete checklist because we're not really robots. What it is really useful for is removing systemic bias. So when you don't have any of these expectations written down, often one of the interesting side effects are people in sort of minority positions or people who are underrepresented will often suffer from this promotion system because people will often say, hey, you're my buddy. I think you're ready for promotion. And other people are saying, well, why did they get promoted versus somebody else? So that's some useful tips if you're thinking about establishing a career ladder. But specifically to this tech lead role, one of the interesting things is mapping what is this journey of a typical tech lead, right? So as a junior engineer, you've probably started to come in. You need some help. You need somebody to help you break down a problem into small steps. You learn some new tools, and you start to solve interesting problems. As you gain more experience, you're starting to solve maybe more complex problems. So as a software engineer, you've learned a lot about things like TD and refactoring and clean code and domain-driven design. And you're a lot more independent, right? So you can take bigger chunks. Now, as you get more experience, you have more impact. And maybe as a senior software engineer, you start to maybe coach and mentor and help other engineers grow. And maybe you can take part of maybe a responsibility of a, uh, of a, more, uh, of a larger part of a system or a, a sm small microservice of some sort. And so the most logical step that most people think is that this tech lead role is actually the step above this senior software engineer. But I'll explain why it's not. Now, in the US, they often talk about a two-track model of career development. So they often talk about this idea of being an individual contributor, right? So the person who is doing and writing code. And they often talk about this track, which is all about management. So you might think about engineering management. You might think about uh, um, a VP of engineering, right? I would actually argue that there are three tracks. And this is what I describe as a trident model of career development. So you really think about tech leads and technical leaders being people in this sort of track here. And in some companies, they're not really coupled to people management. Now, in some companies, they are. But in a lot of other companies, you have people responsible for technology and leading technical topics. And you have a different sort of stream for management. Now, if you look at what tech leads do and you look at respected technical leaders, they're not necessarily writing a lot of code themselves. So they're not really, truly, individually contributing. They're using influence and leadership skills in the context of leading technical topics. And so I would argue that this is actually a third track that a lot of companies should start to recognize when they're thinking about building your own career ladders. So if we go back to this idea that this tech lead is this promotion, you really need to start thinking it's not on that same track as an individual contributor. It's actually on a very different track. And therefore, it requires significantly different skills and has different expectations. So typically, the way that I sort of describe things here is that tech leads will be here on this technical leadership track. 
engineering managers would be sitting on a management track, and you might have perhaps staff or specialists Special, uh, specialist type of roles in a true individual contribution track. And they're sort of at the same sort of level. So this is very interesting. Let's look at each of these. If you think about 70 to 80% of your time, right? It's interesting because engineers say, always like to say, I like to spend all my time coding. But if you really look and measure people's time where they spend, good engineers won't be 100% of their time writing code, right? Good engineers will hopefully be talking to users and trying to understand what is the real need. Good engineers will be showing people what they've built and get feedback from that as well. And good engineers will also be reviewing and providing support to other engineers to make sure that they make good decisions and they collaborate well. But 70 to 80% of their time is really executing and doing, right? So it's about designing the system, it's about perhaps testing that, and of course, coding, right? So that's true individual contribution. Now, if we look at perhaps the management track, I often talk about good managers will manage the system, right? Uh, it's not really about managing people, but managing the system in which people can work most effectively. What does this mean? Well, often this is about supporting, right? So making sure a team have all the resources that they need, all the dependencies from outside teams to do the things they need to do. It's often about planning, right? So to make sure that the work that people are working on is purposeful, that it connects to the broader company mission or the department mission, and make sure that it's aiming towards a specific goal. In a lot of places, it's about budgeting, right? So making sure teams have enough budget, so maybe it's headcount budget, or if it's about financial budget as well. Uh, and it's often about organizing. So sometimes it means changing the structure of how teams work so that teams can be a lot more effective as well. So that's good, effective management today. So where does that leave us with our tech lead and our technical leadership track? Well, there's a whole bunch of things that still need taken care of, even in a world of very agile, self-empowered teams. And so this is what I describe as leading technical topics and teams. Specifically, people in this track will focus on things like aligning the team, right? So it's all great if the team can agree. What happens if a team can't agree? How do you make sure that the team is actually moving towards that same direction? That's about aligning decisions. What about technical risk management, right? Who is championing technical debt? Convincing product owners and other people in the business that now is the right time to re-architect the system because we can see in three months' time it's not going to scale for our needs. Somebody needs to be championing the need to invest in technical risk management. Uh, perhaps it's about technical vision. Maybe we are moving away from a giant monolith to a distributed microservices architecture and trying to make sure that people understand what that direction is versus just doing things the way that things were always done. It's making sure that you are keeping on top of internal tech debt as well, right? So making sure that you get rid of older libraries, you're upgrading libraries to be secure and compliant and modern as well, getting rid of that third persistence framework so that you can stay with only one or two uh, for the time being. And finally, it's also making sure that technical knowledge is being spread across the team. One of the hard challenges of software is, of course, the system is constantly evolving, and so everyone is constantly losing information. Some people might solve this with things like mob programming or pair programming, but somebody needs to be encouraging this practice to make sure the knowledge is spread and distributed throughout that team. And this is very much this idea of technical leadership. It doesn't mean that you have to manage the system or manage people. It means that these topics need to be led in some way, and that this uh, is very important. And it's very interesting, because if you look at these tasks, you're not really relying on your development coding skills. You need to understand them, and that's a really key part of being a technical leader. But a lot of the value you add isn't in the things that you were doing as a developer. So the top tip here is what got you here won't get you there. The things that made you successful as a developer won't necessarily translate to making you an effective technical lead. And nobody has told you this. So now you know. So we found out how people fall into this trap. They get surprised, right? So let's talk a little bit more about what I mean by a tech lead and define this a little bit further. So let's start with what is a simple definition of a tech lead. So it's a software engineer, somebody who has an engineering background, responsible for leading a development team and responsible for the quality of the technical deliverables, right? So product will focus on what's valuable for customers. Somebody needs to be making sure that the system has conceptual integrity to make sure that we're putting the right level of testing or clean code into play. 
uh, it's responsible because it doesn't mean that this tech lead needs to be doing this. A tech lead won't write the entire system for the team. A good tech lead will make sure that everyone is contributing towards the same goal and making sure that all of this is actually happening as well. A common question I get is, well, you know, where do you focus, right? So this is a nice, simple diagram about where you should be focusing on developing yourself if you want to be really effective at this. And what I really describe tech leads being is a good balance between these three circles. Now, as a developer, a lot of the time that you will have spent is probably around this circle here, around development skills, right? Learning the newest tools, learning the frameworks, testing approaches, architectural approaches. Over time, you might have been exposed to some types of architecture skills, right? So starting to think about redesigning components, thinking about coupling and cohesion at a broader scale. Uh, but what a lot of companies won't have helped you with is really helping you develop leadership skills, right? And this is a real key message for you, is that you've probably been spending a lot of your time investing in one of these circles, but to be successful as a tech lead, you need to have a good balance across the three of these things. And so lesson two is making sure that this tech lead role requires effective leadership skills. This is really important. Now, the good thing is, this is not something that, you know, it's a uh, something that you're born with. It's something that you can actually learn as well. So the question is how to shift. Step one, awareness, and this is a very big group, so I'm very happy that you're all here because you know this, all right? So if you're thinking about supporting people in this direction, make them know that they have to start developing new skills. Start to find training, and we work in a really different world today where you have things like Safari, Udemy, Plural site, so many different resources that you can pull information from, but you have to be focused at actually learning and, and putting these things into practice. Um, what's very helpful is often getting coaching. So talk to somebody who's been on this path before. Get somebody who can ask you questions about how you're approaching this. And what's really key is also making sure that you practice. Right? So practice is the skill, is, is the discipline at building really good skill. And so as much as it is at reading something or getting feedback or talking about it, there's nothing like actually putting it into action. So if you're not yet a tech lead and you want to do this, start to look for ways that you can take on the idea of guest leadership, what we heard yesterday, right? Take on the act of leadership. You don't have to own the role, but own something that you really want to have that you think will actually help the team. You can practice this. So if you're looking at your personal development, start to shift away from focusing on new development skills. Focus on developing your leadership skills. Focus on developing broader understanding about system architecture and architectural skills. So a, a question for a lot of people is, well, how much coding should I actually do? I have a lot of other things to take care of. Should I completely avoid coding? All right. It's a very interesting question. Now, it can't be 100% of the time because engineers don't spend 100% of their time coding. It can't be zero as well because you kind of need to know what's actually going on. So a good level uh, rule of thumb that I have is about 30% of the time coding with the team as a minimum. So if you think about a week, you can start to think about at least a day and a half of that is spent with the code, understanding what's actually going on. Now, it's never like that exactly every week, right? So sometimes you get drawn into lots of planning sessions uh, where you might spend a week or two away from the team. But in those two weeks, of, of course, people have started writing more code. There have been new decisions that have been made. And this is telling you in the next week when you come back, you have to spend more time understanding what's going on. Now, it's also interesting where I don't say it's necessarily 30% of the time writing code. You might actually spend a lot more time reviewing code these days, right? So reviewing pull requests, seeing changes and patterns of what's going on, but making sure you understand movements in the code base to see if there's any interesting patterns uh, that are developing. A really good suggest uh, of if you're an effective tech lead is does the code base look like it was written by a single person, right? Now, it'll never really look like that, but one of the real tests is sort of squinting at the code base and looking at the shapes of a code base, right? If you open up part of the code base and you say, oh, somebody has learned functional programming, this is very interesting over here. And then you go over here and you open up things that have very, very strong OO. That's telling you something about the style of misalignment of what's happening in your code, right? 
You have very, very long methods over here, and very, very small, concise, clean code methods over here. That's giving you feedback that you have different personalities of code working at play. And so you have a, a leadership topic to make sure that you are herding your team towards the same direction in a consistent style. Right? So what's interesting here is like looking at the patterns and the shapes rather than the individual bits of code when you're leading a team at a technical perspective. Now, the great thing is leadership is a very well-defined sort of area, and there's lots of uh, skills out there. Empathy, which uh, our keynote today talked about, is a big uh, skill to sort of invest in, and you can spend lots of time reading about books around that. Um, and each of these different skills, if you break down leadership into each of these things, are learnable moments, learnable skills. So you can find training courses around this, books about this, and these are things you can deliberately practice to get better at being a good leader. Now, these are some of the favorite books that I really love to recommend around developing some of these different types of skills. Uh, this morning, I think we heard about crucial uh, conversations, or maybe it was nonviolent communication. Um, the psychology of influence is a really great one, right? Because this is a real important skill for you to develop as a leader. Most people think when I'm a leader, I tell people what to do. But authority is only one type of influence, and it's probably the last one you should actually exercise because you'll sort of take away the trust from people. And you really want to be using other types of influence to get people to sort of move towards the same direction. Getting to yes is super important when you're trying to resolve conflict between the team or across teams when you're trying to make a technical decision. And we all know how hard-headed hard engineers can get when they disagree. They need somebody to help facilitate the right conversations to move the team forward in an aligned manner. So look at these books, read these books, find something that really appeals to you and start to develop yourself in each of these different skills. I really love this quote, reading is still the main way that I both learn new things and test my understanding. This comes from a very uh, well-experienced, very successful person in technology uh, only a few years ago. Any guesses at who this was? Bill Gates, very good, yes. So this is actually Bill Gates, 2016, and is still hungry for knowledge, right? There's an opportunity for us to learn and grow in all ways, and reading it is an amazing way to hear other people's thoughts, approaches, and add them to your own skill sets as well. So invest in building your own toolbox. So lesson three is benefit from these many resources on leadership, but be sure to practice, right? I mean, I'm guilty of this myself. I read a book, say, great idea, and then I put it to the side and I forget about it. And that won't help you develop until you actually turn that skill into a habit until you become part of that as a normal way of working, reading that book won't help you, right? So make sure that you pick one or two things when you read a book, but be sure to practice this thing and turn it into a skill and make sure that you feel comfortable with that. So we looked at the archetypical story, we've looked at what I mean by a tech lead. Let's look at three surprises and struggles that people face when they first move into this role. Now, the first one of these is depicted with this sort of set of people and this like, person in the corner. And this one is really this idea about feeling alone. Right? When you've been thrust into this role of a tech lead, uh, you suddenly feel like a little bit of an outsider. Right? You suddenly feel like, well, I can't talk to the team about all of these topics because like, I'm not exactly the same. Now, when you're an engineer, you could just turn around to another engineer and say, hey, I've got this problem. You can complain together about the same situation. But you're now responsible for that team, and you can't necessarily do that the same way, right? And part of this is just the, the, um, the it comes with the role, right? Other people who are singular in that sort of team, product owners, maybe you have a quality engineer, maybe you have a UX person. They're used to sort of working alone without necessarily a pair to bounce across. But as an engineer, you're normally used to this. And for you to become a tech lead, you'll suddenly feel this is very different. And this can be a, a struggle. Part of it also comes from this idea of being a shield or a filter, right? So there's lots of information you get from the organization, and you're trying to work out how much context does the team really need to have. If I pass on all the information that's happening and it keeps changing, Everyone will start complaining, well, it's a lot of noise. I don't need this information. It's just distracting me. 
And then you'll get other people in the team saying, well, I need more information. I want to know what's going on. I want transparency. And you'll never get it right. Like Every person has a different threshold. And this is something that you'll always have to use your own judgment to work out what's best for the team to help them keep in the flow, to not distract them, but make sure that they have the right context. And that contributes to this ideal of feeling alone. So that's the first surprise and struggle. The second one is kind of depicted by this uh, set of balls in sort of different directions and arrows, right? And this is really the idea of uncertainty. Now, this is really hard as an engineer. I know this one. I still struggle with this one. Um, there is no right answer, right? Sometimes there's only the right answer right now, and you'll get new information that will help you change that answer. But as an engineer, you're used to solving problems with certainty, right? As an engineer, you have this binary habit the test goes red, it goes green, it's the right answer, right? And this doesn't really work when you're dealing with people when you're leading teams. Sometimes you're uncertain if the, the, the uh, answer or solution that you have is good enough. And this is really hard. You're dealing with imperfect information all the time, and you get new information in, which may change the right solution at that time. So dealing with uncertainty is one of the surprises and struggles of everyone. But for engineers who are used to this, it's really hard. The third one is depicted with this symbol of a snowflake. And maybe some of you might understand where this metaphor is going. Uh, and this is really that people are puzzling. right? So people are like snowflakes. Everyone's a little bit different. Uh, and you know, when you're dealing with a computer, you kind of tell the computer what to do, and it'll operate on that. People do not operate the same way, and you cannot interface with people the same way you do with computers. But nobody is teaching you how to deal with people as you transition into this role, and so you will, you will struggle with this. So it's an appreciation that people bring unique traits, and that's also really confusing because they won't work the same way that you do. Right? So how people react won't be how you expect them to react because they'll be different from you. What I really love is this idea about having people's different strengths, right? So I often talk about you build a team because as a whole, you have different strengths where some people will be stronger at some things and other people will be stronger at other things, but you have to recognize and appreciate people for different strengths. Now, strengths applied in the wrong context can actually also be damaging, so you have to be aware of where those strengths aren't useful, right? So if somebody who really likes to problem solve and gather lots of information and be very analytical, and you have a production outage, that's probably not the time that you need to be like gathering lots of information. You kind of need to restore service, right? You need somebody who can act. Um, think about archetypes versus stereotypes, right? So archetypes is this idea of building types of information about theories of how people might act. But stereotyping is saying, OK, I can predict how you're going to act based on my past experience and people will surprise you, right? So archetypes help you understand and empathize. It helps you understand how people might react differently, but for that person in that circumstance, I can guarantee you, you won't be able to predict how they'll actually react, right? So these are three common struggles for people moving into this role, and there are many more which I haven't covered as well, but these are very common, right? So lesson four here is take comfort that others have been on this journey and others struggle with these same sort of surprises as well, right? So reach out to your own network, talk to other people, build your own support structures. And this is really your tip for dealing with this, is really find people who you can rely on. Maybe it's tech leads in the same organization. Maybe it's a mentor who you respect outside of your organization that you can talk to who've been on this path before. But find a neutral party so that you can sort of talk about situations, talk through them, brainstorm challenges, and then understand how you might solve uh, your sort of situation here. So what are, what, what are some tools that can make you a really great tech lead? Let's have a look at a few of them. The first one is really understanding that you are no longer what I describe a person who is developing yourself. Your key amplifier is actually developing your team so that they can develop more effectively. Right? So your focus is no longer on what you do, your focus is on really growing other people so that they can be better at what, what the whole team does as a whole. Now, a lot of people, when they step into this, they often think there are two modes of dealing with people. We can tell people what to do, so more directive style, or we can just simply delegate things. But this is very much this binary habit, right? It's either I tell you or you just decide what you like to do. 
there's actually a little bit more of a style in between, and this is called the situational leadership model. Where at the start, you might be being a lot more directive, right? So a new graduate straight out of university or a fresh person needs a lot of structure to understand how to do something well. But as somebody learns, they understand they don't need to be told what to do anymore. And so you're actually trying to move people to be more independent, to be more um, uh, self-sufficient. So for some people, you might actually need to sell the opportunity, right? So here is why this task is really important. You know that they're capable of doing it, but they just need to understand why, right? Why is this having an impact? Why now? Sometimes problems are so complex that you can't simply delegate it, and you can't simply sort of know exactly what needs to be done, and you might need to actually take part. And so this is called participatory style leadership, where you're actually working with somebody for that. It's actually a style I like working when I'm actually leading a technical team, where you might work with somebody on a particular complex task. You'll be interrupted because you'll have lots of meetings, but you're confident that that task can keep going because your pair has a good idea about what needs to happen. And then when you come back, you can actually continue working with them as well. Right? So think about the situation and style of leadership, and it will depend. Now, of course, not just the consultant answer, it depends. What does it depend on? There are a few things that you want to consider. One of them is thinking about the skill, right? So if somebody doesn't have that experience, they'll need more direction, right? This is where everyone's looking up the step-by-step -step guide or the 101 of how to do this thing, right? The tutorial that tells you exactly what to do. But as people develop skill, you don't need to tell them what to do anymore. You might need to coach them and ask questions about, have you thought about this scenario and what would you do in this scenario? If you're thinking about motivation, right, experienced senior engineers will often be the people saying, ah, oh, no, but this doesn't make any sense. Why do we need to do this? You need to help people understand, once again, how it contributes to the broader purpose. And maybe you're focusing on the what, that's the telling, versus the why, and that's the selling. And then the last thing it depends on is really the urgency, right? So once again, the uh, site outage, right? It's not the time that you want to be asking people, ah, oh, what do you think we should be doing, right? It's like, this thing needs to serve it, like it needs to be restored right now, please make it happen. So it'll depend on the different situations, but remember you have more than just tell or delegate to actually draw upon. Uh, I talked about diversity, and this is really key. And um, one of my favorite books is called Strengths Finder. So it's a book that catalogs 34 different strengths. Uh, and when you do this test, it says what, well, it thinks what your top five strengths are. What I really love about the book is that it really focuses on saying you should use your strengths rather than focusing on your weaknesses, right? And then use other people's strengths to become much more stronger as a team. So achievers are very common in startup land, right? Get stuff done, need to get something done. Um, you have people who have woo, people who can win others over. Really useful if you're trying to influence other people in the business. Um, you have people who are analytical, who need to gather a lot of information, so something that's really complex. Each of these things are useful in different contexts, so think about what they are. And you have people who have a harmony strength of making sure that they restore harmony within the situation, perhaps it's in your team. Really useful in agile teams. And I'm not the only person to really sort of say that this is uh, um, important. BCG actually did some research about diversity. They studied six different factors that actually contribute to economic growth and success. And they actually found out four of them, so not age, not academic background, actually have an impact on innovation revenue. So this is really fascinating, right? So the more diverse that we are in sort of different types of thinking from different types of backgrounds, the better that we can come up with new ideas and solve problems better, and it has an impact from an economic perspective as well. So a very modern research study that I highly encourage you to sort of read. Um, if you went to the... Um, Experience report from being a project manager to a product manager. Uh, this is definitely one of those things. Time management is really key. And that person talked about um, the Eisenhower matrix. So this is really thinking about the things that you decide to do and the things that you maybe get overwhelmed for. Now, what's really key is I want to talk about one of these in particular. And this is this quadrant here, which is the less urgent and important tasks. So, you know, everyone expects you to fulfill your role well, and you're thinking about perhaps tech debt. So what is your strategy around that? Nobody's going to ask you to make time in your calendar to do this. They expect you to have made the time, and they'll want just the answers. And so this is where you really need to decide, for these things that are important, but they'll never be urgent for other people, you have to decide to make time in your calendar for that, right? 
The things that you also want to um, get rid of are these things that you want to uh, delete, right? So Slack notifications, random channel, uh, social media are the things that are distracting you and context switching. So use this matrix to decide how you want to actually use your time. So lesson five is really this summary about moving from maker to multiplier mode. You are no longer rewarded for the thing that you personally make. The code that you write won't be rewarded. You'll be rewarded for the outcomes from your, your team is. So you need to start thinking about developing others rather than developing code yourself. And so this is that mental shift, mental model shift from being maker to multiplier. The more you can multiply other people in your role as a tech lead, the more successful you and your team will be. And that is the distinguishing feature of being a tech lead versus a engineer. So we've looked at these different types of, uh, sort of journey, where somebody comes from, what this tech lead is, some of the common surprises and struggles, and some practical tips that will make you a lot more effective as a tech lead. But it never stops there. The journey is continually growing. I'm still developing my own leadership skills. I'm not perfect. I have my own strengths and weaknesses. Everyone will have their own style as well. So to summarize some of the keys to growth, uh, I want you to remember that this is a role change. It's not a promotion. It requires new skills. And in particular, it requires leadership skills, things you may not have invested in. Uh, others have been on this journey. So reach out to those people and find your own support network to help you on that journey. Uh, and be real. Be, um, Realize that there are many other resources available that can help you on this journey as well. And finally, make the mental uh, model shift from being the maker to being the multiplier and being a true leader. Thank you very much. Thank you, Patrick. Full house. So we'll take a couple of questions. Raise your hands. Hello. Hi. Thanks for your talk. Very interesting. Thank you. Uh, so I wanted to ask, uh, by your role, like chief scientist, right? Um, I don't understand what's your impact on the company. So is this your perception and how you trade and how you train other people? Or it's like a company decision and everybody's following this model that you presented? Yeah, so uh, specific to my role, uh, so as a CTO, I was previously also responsible for management, so people management. Uh, and now I sit more on the technical leadership track. So I don't uh, manage people directly. But what I'm really trying to do is actually grow other people uh, and amplify ideas. So my focus, so the way I describe my role as a scientist is sort of observing systems. So I talk to a lot of people in technology. Uh, I try to distill down good ideas. I try to summarize them, write them up, and share them internally. Uh, and then that often is sort of amplifying ideas. So good idea of like, you know, this team is handling, um, I don't know, retries and reliability really well. Let's write up some patterns from that team. And then other teams start to learn about that and adopt them as well. So we're sort of amplifying both technical practices, but also leadership skills. Cool. More questions? Yeah, I want to ask, um, in the context of Scrum, sorry for asking, Yes. where would a uh, tech, uh, technical leader fit? Uh, so Scrum, so I'm not Scrum certified. Uh, That's good. But I've been doing this for about 20 years. So um, my understanding of Scrum was the very original version. I haven't kept track of like what's been happening. So Scrum, I think, is uh, very simple. Uh, and they only really describe product owner and Scrum master and team members. Maybe it's got more complex over time. But Scrum doesn't really talk about how the technical team really work, right? So they don't really talk about technical practices. I know that maybe there's new technical track in the Scrum, but the original Scrum guide was very much about, you know, the team decides how to do the work. Uh, and that model works really well if the team can agree, <laughs> right? And how many te people have worked on teams where all engineers all agree all the time? Not many people, right? Like, there are phases where the team will generally agree, and then sometimes they're not. And so this is actually probably complementary to what Scrum has in that somebody needs to be making sure that the team does agree on a decision and move forward. So, um, I mean, I would say that even something like XP isn't very explicit about this role. Um, and so this is probably in addition to what Scrum has to solve certain problems. 
So it's not really fitting into how Scrum has anything because it doesn't address a lot of the technical practices. Great, and I think we have one more question over here. Hello, thank you. Uh, so you saw this intersection between leadership, developers, and uh, development, and architecture? Yes. You haven't talked about architecture, so I'm going to ask about that. Sure. Uh, what level of architecture are we talking? Because, uh, sorry, because architecture sometimes can be micromanagement, like if you're talking about design, mm -hmm. or yes. very uh, CIO level architecture, which can uh, be... Yeah, so we as an industry aren't very good with naming, and even the term architecture isn't very well defined. So I always refer to uh, shoulders of giants, so Grady Bush, right? So he talks about how architecture are about the things that are hard to change and the things that are important, right? So that's kind of hard because what does that mean? Now with agile practices, we've learned a lot of things about turning things that are hard to change into a lot easier to change things, so it stops being architecture and being more design. And so this is where there isn't really a boundary between this is architecture and that's design because it depends on how hard something is to reverse, right? So even a simple pattern, let's take a DDD, let's take a repository pattern. If you have that all over your code base and you have many instances of that and then you choose to change patterns, that's actually hard to reverse again, right? Because you can't simply refactor all the re uh, repository patterns to a new implementation. You have to think about, OK, we're moving towards this new pattern. We have all these legacy ones. We want to stop adding in this old way, and we need to move towards that direction. And so even something as simple as a design, repeated many times, can actually be an architectural type of concern because it's hard to reverse. Uh, the trick in agile architecture is really trying to reverse decisions and make them swappable as easy as possible, right? Um, and so this is where good people who think about architecture will be pushing down context to developers because they're constantly making design decisions that may be architecturally significant. So they're trying to help people make decisions that are more reversible, right, to create the right conditions to understand what are patterns that are good to help reverse that. And also for things that are hard to reverse, right, so let's choose a programming language. Once you've built something on that, you have to rewrite it completely. That's very hard to reverse then there'll be often organizational constraints or choices about whether or not you allow that or not. So that's something that a tech lead should also be looking at, right? So you don't want to have 15 different programming languages on your simple, single team. Uh, you probably want to have a common language or one or two, depending on which tasks you have. And so that stuff is architecturally significant. Once again, the, the person who's leading this doesn't need to make the choice. They need to make sure that the team understands what the choice is and is consistent in that manner. Awesome, and we have time for one more question. Hi. Hi. Thanks very much for your talk. You're welcome. So um, you talked a lot about uh, how the tech lead interacts with the development team yes. and uh, the interactions there. How would you say it should be the relationship between the tech lead and someone responsible for the delivery of the project, someone in more like a managerial position? Mm -hmm. Yep. So um, in, I'll, I'll talk about it from an agile context, because this is the world that we're living in. Uh, I believe in a sort of co-leadership team, right? So in a good team, you'll have generally a co-leadership team. So product, engineering management or delivery management, uh, and then technical management. And the idea is that in an ideal world, those two or three roles should be working very closely together and be aligned in what that means. So, you know, if you're trying to uh, work on technical debt, that should be part of the roadmap of product as well, but there should be a good enough relationship between those people playing those roles that both agree to what needs to actually happen as well. So, it's very important that that technical lead really collaborates well with other sort of co-leadership roles, like a product owner or a product manager, or like an engineering manager slash delivery manager, depending on the organization. Um, now, in reality, that doesn't always work out perfectly because people are people and not every group will always get along. But in an ideal world, they should be uh, aligning very well. You're welcome. Great. Thank you very much. Awesome. So I did see, I did spot another two, three people. So I'm sure uh, people will come and find you next over coffee break and networking. And we will see you at the um, amphitheater for the last talk. The game has changed with Jeff. Patton at 4.30. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Patrick. <laughs>